combustible situation. And I think that is the important part to note. We are, you know, this is not your grandfather's vol market. Uh, these are not, uh, you know, everything is much more dynamic, much more, uh, you know, crowded with less liquidity. Um, that all said, in the very short term, um, you know, we are seeing a significant increase in skew um, in uh, an equity vol relative to where it was just a month or two ago with the increase of this, you know, uh, banking crisis. Um, we are also seeing lower vol, um, as many have seen, which has led to even higher skew, generally kind of inside baseball, but when implied volatility comes down, skew tends to, to increase. The downside options versus the upside tends to get more expensive. That has a reflexive, supportive effect. So not only has lower implied vol helped to, to pin markets a bit, um, you know, because it's well supplied at, at cheaper levels, but that higher skew drives that kind of Ghana and charm effect. So we're seeing is this the powder keg, given Yellen said we have until June 1st, which is only in 10 legislative days from now in Congress? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think in, in many ways, the debt ceiling is sort of uh, to deal with, but, you know, that's more a matter of the political realm than it is the macroeconomic realm. Thank you, Bob. One minute until release. Does anybody have any comments to Bob's response? Maybe last there, or Michael. I could also say, as we're waiting our one minute, is that the odds that the even if we get there and this is in result, the, the U.S. is not going to default. Um, the the administration had a dry run back in 2011. The Treasury did to prioritize payments. That's the most likely outcome. I think it's a pause. That's that's my guess. Call it the classic dovish hike here. <laughs> and and actually to to your point there, Bob. In fact, in 2006 they did that same thing um, by officials deciding to signal a possible pause by dropping from their June policy statement uh, the line that quote some further policy firming may yet be needed, uh, and then pause. So does anybody have any other initial comments here before we, we continue down our previous line of thought? Well, I, I, the one thing I'd say about this is, um, you know, there's a challenge. The Fed is, I, I described this a few months ago as a race between, you know, inflation entrenchment and, uh, and, they're, and they're tightening sufficiently to bring, you know, to, to slow the economy. Um, the idea that they might, given the hikes that they've done, that they might, you know, take a beat uh, RBA style and, uh, and, you know, take in some incremental data before making their next move, you know, I think is, is um, more dovish than, you know, if I was running uh, the Fed, but, um, but also within the realm of, of reasonable. I think the main question, the main question, maybe Joseph can give some perspective on is is whether or not they will feel constrained on a forward-looking basis uh, by their choice to pause these funds in terms of um, uh, uh, further raising interest rates in the event that uh, you know the macroeconomic conditions warrant it yeah and we and we can definitely touch on that a bit more too Michael I see you unmuted there yeah, I was just going to say that um, we cannot underestimate um, OPEC Plus's motives here. Um, I, th I have a strong suspicion that the April CPI is going to run hot. Uh, to do something, potentially, and it is an escalation of geopolitical tensions. And war is really inflationary, so you have these big events happening across the world that, that will definitely spill over to, to what's happening here. All right, so I want to – actually, last fair, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add that obviously QT remains remains on schedule, uh, no changes, which I think is everyone's expectation. But um, since I say we don't talk about it enough, just wanted to add that point as well. 
Thank you, Last Bear. So I'm just going to take a quick little tangent. We've got 25 minutes before Powell's presser. But as a quick little tangent here, kind of going back to the Treasury buyback conversation, Joseph, traders are, you know, they're getting more worried about the debt ceiling deadline, especially after Yellen gave that June 1st as the default date. Yields on three-month T-bills are now the highest relative to two-year rates since 1980. About this estimate that Yellen is probably putting political pressure on. Uh, one of the things that we've also learned from the uh, House Financial Services report that I cited was that Powell doesn't like to talk about solutions to the debt ceiling from his end because he likes there to be political pressure to force uh, some kind of con congressional resolution. So I think this is definitely part of the game. Thank you, Joseph. And I'll definitely move over to the panel here in a moment to get some other thoughts. But Joseph gave me a really good segue here to a question I had for Last Bear regarding these you know, creative ways to supersede the issue with the debt ceiling. So Last Bear, in your January issue, $1 bond and the platinum coin, you discuss a few methods of circumventing this very feasible, even though it's kind of a cool idea. Um, and then the other one that I think you know gets more discussion is sort of the, the platinum coin, which is basically the idea that the the, the treasury can um, mint a platinum coin of, of any denomination. There isn't a strict um, cap in in the legal rules on what that can be. Um, so basically, uh, you know, could could make a coin that would allow them to basically put funds directly into their own um, treasury general account, thereby avoiding the need. Thank you, Last Bear. Does anybody have anything to add to that or to anything anyone else on the panel has said so far about the debt ceiling situation? So a question I would have here then, and this will go to the entire panel. Uh, feel free to chime in. That the overall earnings flat between those two dynamics, and it's unclear to me whether um, corporations are, you know, whether earnings are, are set to start to fall, in which case I'd be much more concerned about um, valuation levels, um, or whether corporations, just given um, the years of being able to refinance at low rates, um, enjoy a, a ton of new revenue um, and margin expansion, I, I think are in pretty decent position, generally speaking. And so if they're able to sort of if they aren't as as affected by sort of the monetary conditions and are able to continue to sort of hold earnings at the levels they are, I think that provides support through the market um, as we sort of figure out what's what's to come on sort of the bigger picture macro horizon. So um, I just wanted to add to that point, um, but that's that's it for me. Thank you, Last Bear. And sorry for that mix up again. I don't know what's going on. Maybe I was a little distracted watching that pie chart chop around here. So what I want to do now, we've got about seven minutes to the press, so I just kind of want to go down the line and... The labor market are coming back into better balance. The labor force participation rate has moved up in recent months, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years. Nominal wage growth has so shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. But overall, labor demand still substantially exceeds the supply of available workers. In a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by, by <clears throat> our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation, that that's not my own most likely uh, case, which is really that, that, that the economy will continue to grow at, at a modest rate this year. And I think that's uh, so different people on the committee have different forecasts. That's that's my own assessment of the most likely path. Staff produces its own forecast and it's independent of the forecasts of, of the uh, participants, which include the governors and the Reserve Bank presidents, of course. And we think this is a healthy thing that the, that the staff is writing down what they really think. They're not especially influenced by what the governors think and vice versa. The governors are not taking what the staff says and just writing that down. So it's actually good. That, that the staff and individual participants uh, can have different perspectives. Um, so broadly, uh, the, the forecast was for a mild recession, and by that I would characterize as one in which the rise in unemployment is smaller than is, has been typical in modern era uh, recessions. Um, I, I wouldn't want to characterize the, the, the staff's uh, 
uh, forecast for this meeting. We'll, we'll leave that to the minutes, but broadly, broadly similar to that. Thank you, Chair Powell, Mr. Siegel from the Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. I'm wondering if you can talk about the account of possible effects of a debt limit standoff. You've said repeatedly that the ceiling must be raised, but do you see any economics effects of even getting close to a default and what type of situation would that look like? Um, so I, I wouldn't wanna speculate specifically, but I will say this. Um, these are fiscal policy matters for starters.